today we're talking about love and we're talking about it as a life. And uh, there are a lot of, a lot of, lot of aspects of it that I really can't spend the time I'd like to. I ask you to read the book by Andrew Murray on humility. Humility is absolutely essential to love. Because humility is what enables you to get yourself out of the way. And then actually that allows yourself to come back in. Because love does not lead you, leave you out. See. Wonderful verse in 1 Peter 5. Submit yourselves under the mighty hand of God. You've memorized that. Good. That when the time is right, what will happen? We'll say it out loud, come on. What will happen? He will exalt you. How about that? The standard teaching of Jesus. Now, notice, you will not exalt you. Doesn't say that. You will not exalt you. He will exalt you when the time is right. See, that's, that's the way this works. The verse in Matthew 5, Let your life so shine, your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and exalt you. No. Glorify you. No. They will see God. Now, once you understand the connection between the life that is in you and love and power and all of that, then you see how it fits together. Now, I, want to, I have to touch on one other thing in, uh, about love in general, and then I want to try to relate all of this to spirit. And uh, that'll be our main job for today. But here's what happens if you aren't careful with love is you don't know how to limit it. And that leads into people thinking that to love is to just do whatever people want. Now this is one of the things that is scariest about love and it also ties in deeply to the problems with Jesus' teaching when they are read legalistically. So you read a verse that says, Give unto him that would ask that ask of you, and the one who would borrow of you, don't turn away. <laughs> so if someone says, I'm going to borrow your gun to shoot you. <laughs> yeah, well, well. Right. Love is self-limiting because you are a finite creature in a communal context. So when you love one person, that does not mean you do not love others and that you do not love yourself. But you have to be responsible for judging. And I want to really drive this point home to you because one reason that makes people take a legalistic reading is so they won't have to exercise a responsible judgment. And folks, that's just not in the, in the situation here. Responsibility for judgment under God is a part of being a loving person in God's world. You have to be responsible for judgment. And the judgment is always guided by what is good. So when you are acting in love, what you have in view is what is good for everyone affected.
So if you're going to love your enemy, well, suppose your enemy wants something very bad, is to love them to do what they want or to allow them to do what they want. I had a friend once who was a loving man, he really was, but he was given to legalism. And he said if a man came down the street with a rifle shooting people, the only thing that he could do would be to kneel and pray. Now I, re I use this case purposefully because it really gets into a whole knot of issues about loving. And sometimes it gets discussed in general terms like pacifism. And sometimes it's simply a matter of resisting evil. Didn't Jesus say don't resist evil? So does that mean you let anyone do whatever they want to? Now, this is where it's very important to understand how Jesus teaches. In general, Jesus teaches contextually in a context. And if you want to understand what he's talking about, you have to understand the generalization that he is dismissing. You have to understand what is the generalization that he is dismissing. So when he, is say, when he says, blessed are the poor, what is the generalization he's dismissing? Poor are cursed. Poor are cursed. The rich are blessed. Now you all know that was the thinking, wasn't it? So that when he's talking with the rich young ruler and he's talking about how hard, it, how hard it is for rich people to enter the kingdom of God, that he wasn't talking about people going to heaven. That's connected, but not the same thing. And it's very important to understand that. Entering the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of God is not the same as going to heaven. There is a connection and you need to understand it. But I'm hoping by this point in our time together you understand the kingdom of God is a reality that is here and now. And the issue of entering the kingdom of the heavens or of God is an issue about entering into an interactive life with that kingdom now. So blessed are the poor. Really. Because it's so wonderful to be poor. Hadn't you noticed? It had slipped me. <laughs> the blessing is not in the condition, it's in the kingdom. And the point is, the Beatitudes are proclamation of the gospel. They are simply indications that blessing is available to anyone in any condition in the kingdom of God. And of course, Luke gives you the wobies, doesn't he? And who do the wobies turn out to be? Precisely the ones that human beings say are blessed. Hmm? Did Jesus resist evil? Yes, he resisted evil. What's he saying when he says, turn the other cheek? No, don't resist. What's he, what's he responding to? He's responding to the normal human way of acting that was authorized by religion. Sometimes without much basis in the law, like, for example, when he comes to the point about you shall hate your enemies, the old law, he said, well, that was something that had been cooked up by people. It wasn't actually commanded. You shall hate your enemies. 
No, no. Now he says, love your enemies. See, he's speaking against a practice. And if you don't understand that, it's very hard to get what Jesus is saying in many, many passages. And look with me a moment at Luke 14 to get a vivid illustration of this. And the general thought I'm trying to get to you right now on this point is that you have to understand how he teaches in order to understand what he teaches. And if you don't do that, legalism again will run rampant over you because you will see what he's saying as laws, a very common misreading, especially of the sermon on the mount and the Sermon on the Plain. Now in Luke 14, verse 7 and following, he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table. A common practice in those days, not unnoticed today, though many people just put your name on the plate and you go there. But um, he's watching people do this. Places of honor. Well, what would be places of honor? Maybe the head table or wherever the honcho was going to sit, sit next to them. Now he says, when you are invited by someone in a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you shall come and say to you, get up from this chair and go down there. And in disgrace, you slink out to the card table <laughs> in the kitchen. <laughs> and you will sell. now. He says, when you are invited, then you go to the card table. And the master will come in and say, well, where's John? And they will say, oh, he's at the card table in the kitchen. And he's, what? John, come up here. And you will get up and you will walk up to the head table and you'll sit down and people will think, my, he must be important. He must really be something. He must be somebody. Now, can you in your wildest moments imagine that Jesus was actually providing you with a formula for being honored at a banquet? But he said that, didn't he? Well, he gives a general teaching that helps us in the following verse. Everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. So now this is how do you get to be exalted. There's a grain of truth in it. Humble yourself. Well, but would you think he is recommending that as a social device? No, he's not. But he is telling you something deep and profound that allows for the fact that the person who went to the card table first was actually not humble. He just had a strategy. The following is when you, verse 12, you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. lest they invite you in return. That plainly says, do not invite your relatives, right? <laughs> now, some of you have been looking for that verse. <laughs> but, see, you always read what he says in the light of what he is setting aside. And he is setting aside the practice of quid pro quo. And he's saying, invite people, help people who can't reciprocate. 
because you're in the kingdom of God and that's where you're taken care of and you don't need to play that little game and by the way you can invite your relatives too the point isn't about the relatives the point's about the practice now in all of the teachings about love you want to keep in mind that love is something that takes into consideration everything that is at issue in the context and you don't become obsessed with the legalism about this person because your action affects other persons and especially it affects you now some of you I know are psychologically sophisticated and you know something about boundaries and about how important they are and you see, one of the things that really unnerves people when they read the teachings John, uh, of 1 Corinthians 13 or Jesus' teaching is it looks like you ain't going to have no boundaries. And that is going to really mess you up. And it's going to hurt a lot of other people. Because you have to be able to take care of everyone involved as much as you can, and that involves you. And it's very important to take care of yourself. Because if you ruin yourself, you can't help anybody. You wind up a basket case of one sort or another. So being able to love others your neighbors and so on is a matter come on in don't worry about it come on in um, it being able to love others is a matter of taking care of yourself and that is not selfish unless it's just a matter of you running your kingdom and doing what you want and disregarding the well-being of other people and then it's wrong because at that point you are now not limiting your love for yourself property properly so now let me just say do you get this idea of self-limiting love is self-limiting it is self-limiting because it sees what is good and that takes into consideration the finitude of every one of us and the fact that we live in a community. And my friend who said the only thing I could do is kneel and pray for the guy going down the street shooting people was not exactly loving the people he was shooting. Would you think? Huh? Did he have any obligation to them? Now, if it were actually true that the only possible thing he could do is to pray, well, then he should do that. But there might be some other things that he could do while he prayed. Or pray as he did it. Perhaps even taking the life of the gunman. Hmm? Can you do that in love? Now I'm trying to toughen up your understanding of what love is. Can a soldier be a soldier and act in love, in war? Well, you'd have to say right off that probably most of them don't. But could they? Now you can't begin to approach that and this whole issue of passivism and so on unless you understand this. So I'm going to stop for a moment and just ask you to think about it and see if you have questions. Because this is really vital. If you're going to be a 1 Corinthians 13 person, you have got to understand this. And that you have to be able to make judgments in humility, that is dependence upon God, that's what humility is. If you've read the Murray book, you've got that. It's dependence on God. You make judgments in the realization that you are not infallible, but that you are the one on the spot and you have to make the judgment. 
And that's okay. God understands that. So we're not reaching for infallibility, we're reaching for responsibility. Responsibility in love. Now, take a moment, make your hardest statements, and ask your hardest questions on this. Are you able to act in the light of that? It takes some training and practice and all of that, but you have to have the idea first. And if you don't, love as described in the New Testament and practiced in Jesus will lead you to a death on the cross with no resurrection. I don't know if I can say that again. <laughs> I say, if you don't understand this, you will be misguided about love, and it will lead you to a death on the cross with no resurrection. The resurrection life, which is love, is where you want to live. And you can do that. You will sometimes face the criticism of other people who want you to do what they want done. And they say, why well, aren't you a loving person? And you will say to them, that's exactly why I'm not going to do what you want me to do. Because I love you. Yes, sir. When you say the self do you like say requires discretion? To I say the reason that you don't do something is because you love. That's, uh, and that's self-limiting. So, quick for instance, might be parents who have been taking care of their child who's Absolutely. Not, college, not giving them money. That's right. That's exactly right. And, we, and actually, we all know this with children. I hope we do. We know that you limit your love by what is good for the child. And you have to teach the child that. And if you don't, they'll never grow up. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Ma'am? I just have a comment. I was just thinking, I'm a, I'm a gardener, and I'm sure other people are. And the same thing when you're talking about the boundaries and the love and not mm -hmm. letting it all happen. I mean, you prone constantly right. to... <clears throat> Right. Put those resources to get that better growth. Right. And that pruning can be very painful. That's right. And the husbandman prunes the vine, doesn't he? Even if it is fruit bearing, he prunes it that it might bear more fruit. And that's a general principle of love. Why does he prune it? Oh, he just loves to see that things clipped off. You know, <laughs> he, he wants to see it fruitful. Yes, sir. I, I agree with the statement and I, I like very much the, the take on it, but I guess I'm thinking in terms of a critic who might um, mm -hmm. say, if, if we're taking a, you know, our responsible judgment on mm -hmm. you know, the, the reading or whatever the words of Christ, mm -hmm. that, that might lend itself to a, a situational ethic or kind of an individualized truth interpretation. You know, and what, what would you say to that, and how would we guard against that? Right. Well, uh, the only way you can guard against that is, first of all, deal with the whole issue of relativity. If you were talking to a sensitive and intelligent person, you, you want to discuss that, say, yes, there's a problem here. Now, how do you deal with it? And then you talk to them about how, for example, living in community with others, studying the matter, reading the Bible, thinking about it. See, that's, you, that's the way you form responsible judgment. Uh, one might say, well, you know, plumbers, their judgments are all relative because they just do what they think. And that's true. You can't do plumbing by formula. You have to know exactly how you do things and you make judgments about what to do. And by and large, it works very well. But a plumber is working in a community of other people who have judgments. He learns from them. He knows how to distinguish cases. And that's true in every area. Now, today, the threat is, see, we have a general ideology where moral knowledge has disappeared and judgments are treated as if to say the word judgment was to say, well, it's just your idea. 
And of course, there's a tricky sense in which I haven't forgotten you. I'm going to come back to you, okay? Um, uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which only judges make judgments. <laughs> so every judgment is a judgment of someone. But that's simply in the nature of what a judgment is. It doesn't mean that it's not right, not well-founded, and so on. So you live in a communal context, and the discussion keeps going, and you have the scripture to guide you, and common sense to guide you, and so in that context, you make judgments as to what is appropriate in the given circumstances. And again, we do that more comfortably with children. Uh, but um, we take a vacation from responsibility for our kids as they get older and turn them loose. And the students come to USC and they are told, well, you know, um, we have some rules about what you do in the dorms and what you can do in the classroom, but other than that, uh, suit yourself. And out the other end of that pipe comes a lot of human disasters. But see, we're not in a position, now I know you Denver Seminary and uh, re religious schools do a little better on this, often actually not much better. Uh, but that's what we have to deal with today. So your question is really very right on and important to do, and I think there is no answer to it except, well, you have to learn to exercise a responsible judgment. Yes, ma'am. You had talked about um, the biblical concept of pruning as being a foundation for this. What other texts, or is there anything in First Corinthians 13 that is pointing you to a self-limiting love? Self-limiting love is uh, that language you won't find in the scripture anywhere. Uh, but if you read nearly any of the passages, like Ephesians 4 and 5, Colossians 3, or any of the times where you have Paul talking about what you can do and what you cannot do, you'll see if you compare them with one another, the judgments, that they limit one another that uh, if you, uh, even if you take the Sermon on the Mount and uh, uh, you think about uh, what you would have to do to be in a position to help people who ask you for things, uh, you're going to see that that commandment is limited uh, by others that, uh, that talk about, for example, in the, in the same passage, um, uh, the l speaking truth, uh, giving uh, help to other people that will be limited by what you do in terms of giving to others. For example, if you're going to give to someone, then the, the other people that you are responsible for and you're still responsible for them, where does your resources come from to do that? So the language of self-limiting love is not anywhere in the scriptures that I know of. You have to think about what is taught and see that that's what's required. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I guess, how would you talk about you know, you said like if you're a soldier or, that some, or the guy running down the street with the gun killing people, mm -hmm. maybe love would look like, in that sense, killing him, even taking his life. Like, how would you respond to like John Howard Yoder or Walter Winker, the proponents of act of nonviolence? Well, uh, we have a disagreement, and um, I would listen, and I do listen to them. Um, <coughs> The concept of an act of nonviolence is a good one, but then you have to define what counts as violence. Now, I do that in terms of what good is at issue. What good is at issue? And uh, an act of violence would be something like using force. And an act of nonviolence would be 
uh, not using force. Now, my friend who said, well, I could kneel and pray, that would be an act of nonviolence. Uh, what others you could do? Well, I don't know. Maybe you could try to rush up and embrace him. Uh, I suppose that would be an act of nonviolence. So there are things to be done, and we need to read people like Walter and others who have things to say about this, but we still have to decide what we're going to do. And, and they are especially important in bringing out the fact that very often we turn to violence before we should. And that's most wars are bad because of that character. The lady in the back row, and then you had a point. Back to uh, self-limiting love being found in Scripture, what just popped into my mind was the kenosis passage in Philippians. Mm -hmm. Christ's own emptying of himself, limiting himself. Right. Now you want to remember uh, uh, that in that limitation too, he was doing that in a larger scene. And it's a typical, one of the greatest statements about what happens when you empty yourself and God exalts you. Um, but uh, his, his, his action of limiting himself and coming into the world uh, was constantly involving the kind of thing that that we're talking about here. You have to. Why wasn't? Why didn't he come in like an explosion of some sort? You know, he had, what was the function of his limitations? And well, it was something else that was good that he wanted to accomplish. But nearly all of the teachings of Jesus and the New Testament, if you, if you simply try to approach them whole, you see how they limit one another. You simply can't do them all. And so then you have to have another kind of understanding that retreats to the level of the inside of the person and makes judgments about what ought to be done in particular circumstances. Those judgments for a person of love will always be in terms of what is good. Yes? Um, I'm just thinking about boundary issues in regard to love. Most people that, that try to live without families really aren't living in love in their lives. No, they're not. That's it true. It's like they are really living more concerned about what people might think. That's exactly about. right. And so and I have a hard time saying that love is love without self limiting. Um, well, actually, no, no, it isn't. But I, I'm hoping that this might be helpful in spelling that out by saying you live in a communal context. To love one person at the expense of others is something you have to make decisions about. And then you have to add on, to love a person is not necessarily to do what they want. And the boundary issue gets involved there too. Like for example, I always tell someone who is involved in the receiving end of domestic violence, call the police. Call the police. Now, that's the best thing you can do for the abuser. That's the best thing you can do for the abuser. The abuser doesn't want it and tries to manipulate the abused in all sorts of ways by saying, don't you love me? You know, and it's just terrible what goes on there. But the idea of self-limiting love puts you in a situation where you can do what is good because there is a standard other than what people want. Yes? One of the most interesting things in the Gospels that I've never heard preached on is how Jesus constantly eluded their grasp or just disappeared or somehow got away from the law. That's hard. So he, he definitely had an awareness of his finitude um, as a man on this earth. Yeah. And he did take uh, measures to uh, get away from violence. He didn't let people kill him before he was ready for that to happen. And that was a judgment about what was good and what was right. Okay, well, I, I, hope, this, I hope this discussion will help us. And I wanted to just finally give you this little transparency. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Does, uh, 
Does the language of unconditional love muddy this one? It does muddy it because it really means that you give people what they want without limit and you focus with no condition and unconditional love is something that only God can do. Unconditional love by in its essence as unconditioned involves infinitude, not finitude. It's another case where a Christian teaching becomes perverted and turns into a very destructive cultural artifact. I love you unconditionally. Okay, perfect love cast out fear. How does that work? Well, you have to see love in this context of life and light and power. You understand that it is not just a little thing of willpower. You take love into your life from God. God loves us. And we, the second move, we love God. And the third move, through God, we love others. And find ourselves then in a community of love, where we are loved by others. And that is the structure that is presupposed when we say perfect love casts out fear. Because when you are in that context, then you are in a position where you have nothing to fear. Mm. Wow. Is that biblical? Yes, it is biblical. The wonderful statement in Hebrews that's tied to a statement which everyone knows that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but uh, usually we don't uh, recognize that that wasn't the beginning of the sentence. And you need to look back in this passage in Hebrews 13, verse 5, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor forsake you, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid of what man shall do unto me. And then he goes on to say, remember those who have lived this way, and observe the result of their faith, imitate their faith, which was Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, you don't want to burden yourself if you still have, or if you're troubled with fears, but you need to open yourself to the work of God and find those things that will help you remove fear. Uh, fear is not uh, an inappropriate emotion for a human being in this world, but it is something that we can grow away from. Maybe that's the best way to put it. We can grow away from it. And if we find ourselves fearing, that is anticipation of evil or harm that is coming to us, then we need to try to put that in a context where our vision of God takes care of the fear. We have a lot of high water marks in the scripture one of which is the very end of the little book of Habakkuk. And uh, Habakkuk is looking at the sure and certain destruction uh, of his nation. And um, let's see, is that in the Old Testament? Um, yes. It is. To go back and run through my memory verses. Hmm. 
Yep, where is it? Here it is. And right at the end. Now, this I'm, I want. I please relate this to Psalm 16:8 that we were using earlier. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there will be no fruit in the vines, the yield of the olive should fail. The fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. Now that's famine and desolation. Yet I will exult or exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds feet. That is, you're able to walk in high and difficult places safely. Okay, now we need to, to move on from this teaching back to the understanding of the human being as a spiritual being in a spiritual world. Without that, we simply cannot deal with life in a way that allows the kingdom to flow through us and to live a life of love. We simply can't do it. We have to understand that we are spiritual beings. That involves our body, of course. And we have to make a connection there that will say, I am indestructible. Hmm? That's, the, that's the deal. We have to come to think of ourselves as indestructible. Under God. You cannot do that if you think of yourself as simply a physical being. Because if you are a physical being, you are destructible and you will be destroyed. A lot of people today under the influence of the culture want to think in terms of being their brain. Now, if you are your brain, we know what's going to happen to you. Right? And you, when you stand up in church and you sing, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, you are speaking balderdash, if you are your brain, because your brain is not going to be there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. So, now, so we're pushed all the way back now to the verses we worked on yesterday. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you also will appear with him glorious. Hmm? Then shall the righteous shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Is that anyone in this room? That's your destiny. That's the kind of thing you are now. That's why you're indestructible. And that's why you have nothing to fear. If you are living with Jesus, you are a participant in the kingdom of God now. It's an eternal kingdom. Eternal life is not something that starts after you die. Eternity is running now and you are invited to live in the kingdom of God in a way that what constitutes your life here is preserved in what is eternal. Hmm? Now then, you can begin to say, oh, well, maybe, maybe perfect love does cast out fear. And that is the structure, and of course then, once that is 
cast out. This, this is what's coming later for us, okay? Then we can stand to live in truth because we have nothing to fear. You know the Eastern philosopher that said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you flee. <laughs> That's kind of a natural <laughs> response to truth if you're living in darkness. The truth shall make you flee. But this truth will set you free. And uh, you know the passage in John 8 where it's discussing this. He's talking about being free from sin, being enslaved by sin and being free from it. And now here's what he said. He said, if you abide in my word. Okay, now it's this, so, you know, their translation say, if you continue in my word, and people think this is a nonstop Bible study or something. Well, that's not all bad. But it's talking about abiding in his word, living in his word. The same word, verb, minnow, that is used in John 15 to talk about the branch abiding in the vine. If you abide in my word, then you are my students indeed, my apprentices, my disciples. That's how you be a disciple. But it's referring to putting his words into practice. How do you abide in his word? Put it into practice. And that's the path of the disciple. You abide in his word, and you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Because the truth will put you in touch with reality. That's what truth does. Puts you in touch with reality. It allows you to act in a way that is conformable to, consistent with, dependent on reality. Now, if you don't have, if you have falsehood, you wind up depending on something that's not real. And that's the way that works. The truth makes you free by integrating you with reality. Okay, now, I have to come back to this later, but I want to just say to you now, that's the primary role of faith. Faith integrates you with reality if it's faith in what is true. Faith is not something that God likes and therefore says, oh, I accept you because you, you have these beliefs. I like these beliefs. See, many people unconsciously wind up treating faith as if it were a work of righteousness. As if the advantage of faith is, God wants you to believe that. If you believe that, then he'll be good to you. And then that sleeps over into our social setting and where often we are condemned and accept people in terms of what they, well, maybe not what they believe, but what they profess to believe. And now I'm, I'm getting in deep weeds here because this really has to do with how we include people and exclude people from our fellowship. And one of the things that happens with young people is they pick up the idea that somehow they are to be condemned or not or received or not in terms of what they believe. And that discourages doubt. And they get in locked into a legalism about correct belief. And they wind up professing things that they don't believe because they haven't been allowed to come to them. Right? So we need to understand what, what it is about faith that matters. And what it is about faith is that it allows you to interact successfully with reality. Let's take a, a problem case here, much made of, the virgin birth. 
Do you believe in the virgin birth of Jesus? Okay, I believe in the virgin birth, birth of Jesus. Well, how does that help me? One way I say, well, my group believes in it, and if I don't believe in it, they're going to come down on me. Another one is, God especially wants me to believe it. He likes for me to believe that. And if I don't believe it, he won't approve of me. Now, a virgin birth, where, where a virgin birth occurs of the kind that's involved in Jesus' life, you have got a different world to live in than one where that does not occur. Same way with the Bible. What's your view of the Bible? Do you have your beliefs about a high view of the Bible because that's socially enforced or because you think God just especially likes it or because having a high view of the Bible really makes a huge difference in your life? Hmm? Well, that's number three. Now, God does like for us to believe it, because actually that's true. And it's nice to build a fellowship around it, but if you aren't careful, you get a fellowship that's built around a profession where there's no real faith. So when you hear a person talking about the Bible one way or the other, you want to know to what extent do they rely upon the Bible and study it and honor it by their behavior, not just what they profess to believe about it. The question for the Jesus seminar is, what do you do about the parts that you believe Jesus did say? <laughs> and probably if they would do something about that, a lot of other things would straighten out. But if we're just going to discuss it and say, well, pink or red? Who cares? Who cares? Charles Finney, one of his stories is about how a man came to him and he said, I want to discuss the Bible, the reliability of the Bible with you. So Finney said, do you believe that you should love your neighbor as yourself? Yes, I, I think that's true. Do you do that? Well, not really. Well, you go and do that and then come back and we'll discuss the Bible. See, that's putting belief where it matters, namely in real life. And if you don't do that, then you can endlessly discuss issues of faith or not faith or profession or whatever, and it really doesn't make any difference. Faith is designed to integrate us with reality. And as it does that, then our character changes, and the final line upon the thing there is, we can be trusted with power. That's what it's all about. So let me give you a sentence and see if you can stand up under it. And that is that God's purpose for all of our lives is that we should grow to the point to where he can empower us to do what we want. Does that go down? See, God's purpose for all of us is that we should grow to the point to where he can entrust us with the power to do what we want. I didn't make a mistake on the pronoun. And you may say, well, the power to do what he wants, that's the, exactly the point. <laughs> but it's not just what he wants, it's what we want. So there is no incoherence. Now, obviously, that's, that's working on 10,000 years. <laughs> okay. Because the wanter needs a lot of working. And actually, that's what our life is about. Our life is about training for reigning. Training for reigning. 
That's why I said earlier, prayer is a power sharing device for a world of recovering sinners. And you know why you get those bombshells of promises in the scripture that make you think anything could be done in answer to prayer? It's because that's true. But probably it will take you a while before God can turn you loose with that. He just doesn't want you to be limited in your expectations about what's going to happen. And he wants us to be able to pray for anything with confidence that God could do it. That's all training for reigning. Coming to the place to where we are living in this wonderful Trinitarian communal structure of love. Living in the truth. Living from the invisible landscape. The things that are not seen. The kingdom of God. Okay, now transition questions. So you have to you have to have a concept of spirit to go with all of this or it won't go anywhere. And the concept of the reality of spirit, and uh, we'll come to that in a moment. Before we do, look at your sheet on love of neighbor, and let's see if you have questions and comments about it. I just make some points that I hope will be helpful in thinking about love of neighbor, uh, and we've covered some of these in our discussion. For example, what love is. We talked about that. Um, and uh, basically we've covered what I say is the first major step here uh, towards the bottom of the first page is to decide to be a person of compassion. A uh, person of compassion is someone who allows themselves to feel the need of other people. And that goes, throws us back now to which landscape we're living in and so on, but we won't go back there. We just hope you can bring that over. Yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering, like when you say this part about compassion is a constant burden of life and all of that. Mm -hmm. You say it requires resources, but I'm just wondering like what specifically will prevent you from being overwhelmed by the endless amount of needs, even just yeah. right around you? Well, in part, what we've just been through. But you're going to also need disciplines that will enable you to be clear about where you're standing in the face of all those needs. And will... Uh, mean that you are a rested, clear-minded person who can make decisions. Now, many people handle this problem simply by shutting off compassion. And frankly, I think to some degree you have to do that. When I think about some of the issues in this world, if I, if I just stayed there, I wouldn't be able to do anything else. And there are a lot of those issues. And uh, so you, you do have to exercise a judgment and then you have to do things like rest and solitude and silence, meditation on scripture, fellowship with others. You have to take care of yourself. Of course, always under God, but you have to do that or it will simply overwhelm you. That's one reason why I use that language, self-limiting. Because you have to understand that if you're going to be a person of love and compassion, you have to limit it. And it won't be done for you. Yes, ma'am? That comment makes me think of um, in Mother Teresa's writings where she talks about, you know, that she would only love one at a time. And it's, you know, in the sense of compassion, right. being self-limiting, that mm -hmm. when you're loving the one, you're not loving. Yep. 
the other million around you. Mm -hmm. So you better believe in God. You really had better believe in God. If you don't have a concept of the greatness of God, the problem of evil in this world will smash you. And uh, so you have to believe that God is big enough to take care of this. I don't know how he's going to do it, but you have to be able to do that. Or you cannot focus on the people who are truly your nibors. Your nibors, the people who are near you. And you'll wind up, as so often is the case, with people who are just so excited about the greatest happiness for the greatest number and making everyone around them miserable. Mm -hmm. So that's really an important point. Yes, sir? You know, last year my wife and I have started taking this approach where we focus on the people we're closest to and it's severely limited or significantly limited our church involvement. Because it really plays wow. out. Wow. Now we're into something big. <laughs> it's hard because there's guilt. There's guilt that oh. Well, but now then you're going to have to you're going to have to work with that guilt, aren't you? I mean, you decide. <laughs> what do you decide? Just to be guilty, or? One thing that that was really encouraging is two of our friends went to Juarez, Mexico, and, and you know daily their lives are mm -hmm. yes, at yes. threat. Mm -hmm. And if we had chosen to start a Bible study, um, it would have meant the, the sacrifice of some of their well-being and us caring for them. So to see it played out so extreme has, has been good for us in dealing with some of that guilt. But You have given us a good teaching, my brother, a good teaching, yes. And we have to, among other things, we have to evaluate our involvement in religious activities in order to see what good is actually coming from the things we're doing. That's a part of what you do in order to enable yourself to live with self-limiting love to accomplish what is good that you can accomplish. I really uh, thank you so much for saying that. And you've touched on a... <coughs> excuse me. You've touched on a sacred cow to involve another religion. <laughs> um, and we really have to be conscious of these. And we have to ask questions like, what are the things that I'm doing that I think I ought to do, but when I look at them candidly, are of limited value, shall we say. Now, actually, that can lead us back to them in a different way where they become of greater value. But that's a really important point. So the first step is deciding to be a person of compassion. And that means you're going to be alert to what's going on around you. That means you will be listening to people. What do you think went through the mind of the priest and the Levite as they passed the man on the road. Well, something did. Something went through their minds. But probably it was because they were not people who were oriented toward being compassionate to what was going on around them. Yes, sir. self love and example of Jesus with the Twelve, they had a relationship that the rest of the followers and disciples didn't. No, that's right. That's right. And that was a choice that he made. And actually, it looked like he was being pretty exclusive. And he was. And investing in people like that requires that kind of exclusiveness. And uh, you, you, there's a, you hear people like on television say, we love all of you. No, they don't. <laughs> love all of you. They don't. And so we have to watch the sloppy language that gets to going and, and in order to be really responsible. And I do emphasize that means you take care of yourself. No one else is going to do that. And uh, so someone else had their hand up. Yes. So would this kind of explain Jesus' words to the, I think it's the, woman um, 
with, about the dogs and, it, and the it, That's exactly the point of it. That's why he said to his own uh, people when he sent them out, don't go to anyone except the Gentiles. I'm sorry, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to anyone except the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, why was that? Sounds like chauvinism to me. Why wasn't it chauvinism? They were ready. They were ready. Now then, he goes for a vacation up in Sidon. Here's a woman with a need. And he listens to her. And she makes a very pervasive case. But he didn't want to have to deal with an outbreak in Sidon where he would have to minister. That was later. Beautiful illustration. Did he hate the woman? No, he didn't hate her. He loved her. But there were other things. Now, here's another case. You remember how often he told people, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. See, that was, the people were not ready to hear. This was a long process that required him focusing on a small group of people to whom he could at one point say, now, go to all the world. See, the Great Commission, we started with last time, is actually a continuation of the Abrahamic Covenant. In you and in your seed will all of the families or nations of the world be blessed. How was that to be done? You can see it, can't you? Now he says, go to all of them. And of course, that had some rough passages in it. And many of the people couldn't quite manage the idea that Gentiles could be a part of this picture. So that had to be worked through. And it's a huge issue that we're still working with today. A social problem was the first thing that broke out in the post-Pentecostal church. And it actually is a rather fine point because it was having to do with widows who were from Jews, who, who were Jews who were involved in the dispersion, and those who lived in Jerusalem. Picky, picky, picky. But that's the way human life is. So compassion now. Compassion. Choosing to be a person of compassion. Learning how to draw on the kingdom of God for that. Learning how to make judgments that limit it. And allow that there are other people who have to do their part. And that God is in charge of the whole thing. And that will keep you from burnout and blow up if you can do that. So the next major step at the bottom of the page is deciding who your neighbors are. That's really a continuation of what we've been talking about. Your, neighbor are, your neighbors are people that you have a significant degree of influence over and can actually do things that will help them, not just formalizations of some sort. So you have to go through that process. Uh, and on the second page, the decision to have compassion upon those closest to us wherever they are. And that starts with our family, our people that we live with, they are our neighbors. So you have to make a judgment about who are these people and that you need to be guided by the Holy Spirit in that and you will have that guidance if you're looking for it. And there will be some changes over time as to who is your neighbor and who is not because that's a growing relationship and uh, perhaps they themselves will be in a different place and be in the position of loving their neighbors. And uh, so then I give a third step here, halfway down on the second page, list the few people who are most intimately engaged I'm most intimately, you are most intimately engaged, engaged with in life. And this should be a fairly small number. 
Now you can still give contributions to people on the street or that's that's a relatively un uh, attached relationship and of course you have to make judgments about that and I would say uh, you need a small group and then perhaps a little larger group and then maybe a third circle of understanding and um, you would then calibrate your efforts to help people in those circles differently. I give a fourth step here. Begin with an inner circle as best you can. Devote serious attention, thought, prayer, and service to two or three people. Allow time for this to develop, probably a few months at least, until it becomes a grace-sustained habit and then you can bring more people into the range of your effective neighbor love and so on. Now in order to do that, you are going to have to have a range of spiritual disciplines for your life that enable you to remain strong and balanced and effective in drawing from the kingdom of God. So now I'm just saying, I mean there's no, nothing legal or infallible about that but I wanted to say I want to say to groups something definite about how you would go about loving your neighbor as yourself because as it exists it's kind of like a cloud a nebulous sort of thing that floats around and we have not identified our neighbors and so we can't really take meaningful steps to love them now in our world you still support people on the other side of the world, you feed hungry children, you do all of that, and that's good, but that is not loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself is a much more concrete, communal kind of thing that you need to identify and work with judgment, made in love, from the life that comes from the kingdom. Now, you have any further comments about that? Uh, questions this is this is saying there's a way to do this I suggest this see what you think and of course if it doesn't work then get something better yes sir is there an easier way I'm sorry is there an easier way <laughs> I don't know no I, I don't know of one I don't think of this as hard actually I think of this as a way of making the practice intelligible and doable. And the, and the main step is uh, really identifying your neighbors. And in our culture, at least out in Southern California, that's a pretty significant task to identify them. <laughs> and, uh, and it means, among other things, in some cases it will be, well, how about the person two, blocks down, two houses down on your block? that you don't really know much about, but, I mean, sometimes the Spirit prompts you in a direction like that. But that ends so seriously now. Yeah. That would be, as far as, like, identifying your neighbor, like, that's not just to just go out and pick whoever. No, no, I wouldn't that. do that. You're you Absolutely that. not. Right. You want to do this prayerfully and asking for guidance. Uh, in some cases, you don't need to ask for guidance because your wife is your neighbor. And you better start there. Amen. Or your husband or your child is your neighbor. Uh, and well, often it's interesting the way this language has developed. We don't think of them as neighbors. And very often we wind up passing over them and not being compassionate on them. But that's, you want to start there and move outward. Yes and yes. I was just going to say to your point, you were, I know you were joking, but sometimes the easy way is to avoid the neighbor. You know, and then we go out into our fellowships or whatever where we feel good with people that are like us as opposed to what God may be teaching yeah. us to engage in that closer relationship. And a really important thing is to think about your small group that you're involved in. 
Are they your neighbors? Yes. Can you unpack what you mean by intimately involved with when we get to maybe the third outer circle? Well, that's that is uh, what would be a case of that. That might be, for example, someone you're sharing a ride to work with. Um, maybe someone involved in a social activity that you would be conscious of and compassionate toward and trying to listen to see what is happening and what are the questions that are going on and what could be said to help them and might something more than that be done to help them and so on. So that, to me, that is a relatively uninvolved situation, but one where you want to be conscious and compassionate still. I, I get tripped up when um, people want to be my friend, <laughs> um, and I don't have room. Well, that's where you just need to, to say... Into the more no, I wouldn't... Al that might be a case where you would find this should be my neighbor, but not automatically, not automatically. Yes, you have to make a judgment about that. Because when people come and want to be your friend, that's, there are a lot of different things that could be going on there. And you want to be conscious of that. And then perhaps it would be occasion where you would say, mm, yes, I think I should do this. But probably it will not be strictly in terms that they had in mind. Still, people reach out to us, and that's significant, and we want to respond with compassion and understanding, and then we have to make further decisions about what we're going to do. Okay? All right. Um, should we take a break now? Just a five-minute break? Yes. Probably not. <laughs> A quick one.